So, obviously, I didn't dress up tonight. Um, I came from a job. I was managing at Shaker Heights. Um, again, my name is Jared Lichten. Uh, I flip houses in Cleveland. I've been doing it for like six years. Um, it's 2020. So maybe Since like, you were 12? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a big boy. I've been around. <laughs> Plant-based diet. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so... I, uh, I've been flipping since I got out of law school. I got out 2012, got a job up in Akron, um, and got interested in real estate real quick, you know, bigger pockets, doing research, heard, heard about the market coming back, that it's buyer's market, you can get deals, all this stuff. I knew a couple contractors uh, from when I was a kid, they've done work on my house, a couple other contractors from just growing up around a lot of Italian people in Mayfield, and then when I uh, started, I basically used my W-2 income from my attorney job, and I was lucky to get that because the market is just flooded with attorneys as it is. Um, I was working in oil and gas at the time, so basically um, I would do, I would run title for oil and gas companies who wanted to do the hydraulic fracturing, uh, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. So I got trained to do title like so deep the right way that like it's so played into getting into flipping as far as like doing research on people as far as figuring out chain of title figuring out how much money people owed on mortgages like if you give me an address right now we could do 10 minutes of research and figure out what lenders are on it what the person probably owes approximately if they owe any taxes just knowing how to navigate a probate auditor site recorder's office in a county the proper way if you've done you know been a realtor or whatever like doing a little bit of research on a property you know how difficult it can be or how easy it can be in some counties um, i had to go to wetzel county west virginia where there's not a hotel within an hour's drive and run title on a parcel all the way back to 1860 all the deeds are written in cursive you actually have to go into the recorder's office and like take pictures print off the pictures and highlight all this stuff. So I'm used to running what's difficult, oil and gas, mineral interests, everything from the surface down to the center of the earth. And when I started flipping, I was like, oh damn, surface interest, that's so easy. You're just looking at liens, mortgages, like chain of title, whatever. So that's where I got my start in oil and gas. And then when I started flipping, you know, I had W-2 income, good job, like 26 years old. Most people wouldn't complain but I was the most miserable I ever was in my entire life. Um, money, it was like the real kick in my teeth. Like I thought, a lot of people I went to law school with probably were in it for the money. And then when I started practicing 100 person law firm, you know, most people I graduated with didn't even have a job coming out of school. And I'm sitting here with a paycheck, benefits and all this stuff, and I hated it. I had three bosses. And when I started my first flip, I basically just would take calls in the hallway. I would. Like, just pick up the phone every time a contractor called me and I was like, hey, get this on this at Home Depot, go do this, make this decision, whatever. So I use as much time as possible at night to do research on bigger pockets. Every single time um, I, I saw someone, a keyword alerted pretty much everyone who's investing in Cleveland, especially contractors, every single time someone commented, I was like, oh, sweet, I got to take this person out for coffee, I got to meet this person. I uh, started doing a podcast in like 2014 and I figured I'd chronicle like one of my flips, like our huge project, a historical house that I bought in like Highland Square in Akron. You guys are from Akron. Love Crosby. Yeah. So this was uh, on here. I'm on the wrong side of Highland Park. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, this one was 954 Hereford. You can look up the pictures. I put, I bought it for 50000 It was listed for 110 then 100 Called the agent. It was a probate property right around the holidays. Um, and basically just said, yo, your property needs a ton of work. There's a foot of snow on the ground. I'll give you 48 for it. I got it for 50 three weeks later. And that was like what I based the podcast around. So going through the lifeblood of like a historical flip that you buy for 50 and put 70 into is way different than the traditional flipping game of buying something for 30, putting 25, 35,000 into it, doing electrical plumbing, you know, the basics and just putting it on the market and getting retail buyers. Um, doing historical home with wet basements and completely, you know, reframing, you know, a house that was built in, you know, 1915 is way different than like getting in a nice cycle and doing like 10, 12 at a time. Did you have a historical society tell them about? I didn't tell anyone. I didn't pull any permits. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> exactly. that gets crazy. You do that until you, you get caught, that. and then right. you realize yeah. it's just like um, it's like dating. It's literally like you know, you make some mistakes. You realize this is where I can cut corners. This is where I can't. I just got no 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 BS. I just got shut down in the city.
for working without a permit. And I'd done plenty of jobs there. I just messed up. My contractor delayed, didn't file a permit on time. I did the drawings, I submitted them. And then the city, I had a meeting with them. You know, they gave me a hard time. I accepted that hard time and I said, listen, I'm embarrassed, it's my fault. You know, when you, like I said, like they, people look at me and think I'm a kid. Like I've been doing this for seven years. So like I, I accept that and I appreciate it. But when the building commissioner or like a housing inspector comes to your house, you always treat them with the utmost respect. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Shake their hand, look at them in the eye, ask them their first and last name, ask for their card. You know, just try to build some sort of familial relationship with them, even if they're complete jerks. And I want to swear now, but this is going on YouTube, so like, it's, <laughs> it's so hard because like naturally, like you know, I say like the F word, which is also fine to say, but I don't still want to swear because like I like I like putting stuff out on YouTube because people get value from it. There's plenty of people out there selling courses, and I don't ever charge money for anything other than like a meetup I did two weeks ago. Um, so I just like doing it. Um, now, basically, fast forward a couple of years, like I told you guys in the introduction, I had a business partnership. Uh, in 2017 when I was living, moved to California in 2016 uh, for personal reasons. And then when I scaled up and tried to do eight, 10 flips at a time with my guys, more construction people I got, I mean, 2017, I had just turned 30. I'm like, screw this, I'm gonna be super aggressive. I'm gonna make all this money. And I partnered with the wrong person, wrong time. You know, 2018 got married, all this stuff happened all at once and it paused. I had nine hard money loans at that time, earlier this year basically, this is October 2018. So a little over a year ago, um, you know, $11,000, $12,000 a month coming out of your pocket, being in California physically and having to fly back to Cleveland to try to manage these projects, you know, getting my teeth kicked in like that, you know, was a huge wake up call, losing pretty much all the capital I had, but still being able to keep my crews going at a pace where they didn't even know what was going on. They're just like, okay, next house, next house, next house. Um, middle of this year, um, after my last flip was in Shaker Heights. Um, so I've done everything from buying something for you know, 30, 40,000, putting 30, 40 into it and selling it in the hundreds up to huge gut rehabs, hiring architects and all this stuff, all new electrical. Um, so I'm used to working in the hardest cities, Cleveland Heights, Shaker Heights. They have point of sale, you have to escrow money. Um, you have to know how to kind of work with them. You said you did something in Shaker. They would gladly give 60-40 or 50-50 to someone like me because I'm going to get their flip done in five, six weeks. That's how it should go. That's how a nice rhythm should happen. You demo, you do your electric, your, your plumbing, you submit any permits you have to. You know, you get a good drywall paint or GC managing the project who has a couple of his own guys. And it's speed. And at the end of the project, if there's something off of quality, you go through and they fix it. That rhythm should be struck with all projects, but it doesn't because contractors are self-interested. They are, any anything that they can do to be a little bit lazier, take a little bit more time or a little bit more money, shave it off the top and hire a sub in, it happens all the time. A plumber you hire will take another plumber that he knows and you have no idea, he'll give you the contract for 1800 bucks and he'll hire someone to do it for 800. And he sits on his and doesn't do anything and someone else messes up and then he has to go fix it anyways. So that kind of stuff with like me going through so many flips now, like from the last six years, I know that that kind of behavior happens and I'm here to kind of like help curb that kind of stuff from happening to you guys. Cause I have been, I've, I've had years where I'm super successful and I've had years like 2018 where I get my like super interested and think like I know Jad from before, like I'm super interested in property management because Every single multifamily investor I've met, like living in LA for three years, everyone's in multifamily. And when they talk to me, they're like, oh, you're from Cleveland, da da da, my property management company sucks, or this property management company sucks. I'm like, yeah, because you're talking to someone who has no interest in your building and they have one handyman trying to do repairs on 50 units. Like it's, like that, it's just so cut and dry for me to kind of see like these kind of issues happening, but like contractors, contractors have to be incentivized financially. Money is 100% how things get done, but it's also how you can defend yourself on a job. So like, if you say, want to pay a contractor in draws, there's no way that you can get a contractor to start working without paying them a deposit. So generally, if you have someone new, and it's a huge contract, maybe you can do 25% for draws, but like generally thirds for a new contractor is kind of sufficient. Um, if it's a plumber or electrician, usually splitting it in half is okay, half to start, half at the end. But they have to get money to feel comfortable that they're gonna get paid. Because every contractor around here, on the flip side from an investor, an investor has ripped them off. An investor has 
you know, take, you know, they finish the project, they say, where's my money? And the investor goes. So it's almost like a drug deal. You meet someone in an alley, you know, you're kind of giving them something and then you're kind of getting something back. People are just, it's very tough to deal with construction, especially on like a, I mean, I'm doing a $70,000 rehab in Cleveland Heights right now. And it's a different type of project. I have a GC on the project who pulled his permit, but I also have a ton of tradesmen. I have an HVAC company, a roofer, an electrician, and a plumber on the deal because A, speed, and B, like guys getting into their mode of working where they're supposed to be. A GC, someone who's on the project, really, unless there's just like a couple of shutoff valves, shouldn't be doing plumbing. If there's a like, rough plumbing that has to be ran, hire a plumber and have him come do that, and then you're never gonna have to see the plumber again. But if your GC is not painting and not doing drywall and not managing guys and answering questions for them, it's just gonna delay the project more. So the more management and the more, um, uh, what's the word, leeway that you give, the more of an opportunity someone can take advantage of you. And just being in the flip game, there's just so many like shady people in this business because you can make a lot of money very quickly and when it comes to the end of a project and some investor in, let's say, Florida or California is sitting there thinking, well, I'm gonna make 25,000 on this project, but if I don't pay my contractor the last 15 grand, I can just bounce on him and he'll never find me. That stuff happens all the time. It's not like it happens all the time. So I'm basically here to just do like a light Q&A, answer any of your guys' questions. Um, I myself like have a couple rental properties or whatever, but like, as far as managing projects, construction, structuring deals too, because like any t any questions you guys have about doing like JV relationship, I'm so used to doing that stuff now, and I'm an attorney, so I just draft everything myself. Um, There's so many ways that you can get in, even as a beginner, to manage projects. Like um, I just started writing for Bigger Pockets, and the first article I wrote was like literally the easiest way you can make money and get started in real estate is managing a project getting your Rolodex up, knowing a couple contractors, getting comfortable with an area, having time on, like having an extra time on your hands and saying to like the general public, hey, if you're doing a flip here, you know, you're a, everyone who flips is stressed. And if you can be another layer of human capital managing that project, people will give you equity. People will like, people will give you a piece. Uh, maybe it might not be 35%, it might be more like 15 or 20, but if you negotiate, everything's negotiable in real estate. One of the best books I read recently, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Never Split the Difference, yes. I got Chris, Chris Voss, it's such a good book, because you know you understand, you're reverse engineering everyone else's, like what they're interested in. Contractors are interested in speed, making money, and getting more projects, taking care of their family. The, before we go on to Q&A, for sure, um, the best piece of advice I can give you for like working with contractors, don't just talk about don't talk to them about the project when you walk them through a project. If you see like a new person um, and you've never met them before, say you're walking them around a project, even if it's just like a rental with like some light work, drywall, a kitchen, a bathroom, um, ask them about their personal life. Be like, hey, what's going on with you? Like, you know, I heard you're from Brunswick or whatever. Tell me about yourself. And as people, people like to talk about themselves. And the more you know about a contractor, like, it's mostly men, like that's. Just, but when I see a guy, I just say guys because it is mostly men. Um, but I, I usually, you know, if he tells me he has a family, he has a two-year-old at home, you know, he's he's doing it for the right reasons, you know, um, he's trying to support his kid or build a college fund or whatever. When they drop things like that to me, it says that they're in it for the right reasons and they're a good person. But if they're talking about like, you know, going out and having a good time with their friends or they're being very vague about like certain things. I feel like, you know, it's a business relationship. You're giving them money to work physically. And when you don't pay someone for a job that they did, it's literally slave labor. Like that's what not paying someone for construction is. They did work for you and you're not paying them. So like, it's so meta, like what I've been in the past, like six years, I'm so used to dealing with people every day. I, I reverse engineer what they're interested in. So like, I know that they just wanna get paid on time, take care of their family, and when they're messing up and they're being slow, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm like, hey man, um, you know, you, I'm being kind of nervous here. Like you said that we, we have, we'd have a little bit more progress by this time, and you know, work's not getting done. What's going on? And when he tells me excuses like, um, you know, my kid got sick, I had to take him to the doctor. You know, you know, I have a wife who's on disability. Like so many different guys have different issues, and if they have those type of excuses, 
once in a while, it's okay to give people some fishing line and accept that kind of stuff because real world and real life does hit. People get sick, people die. Um, you know, guys get hurt. I've had guys, like literally one of my best guys, like I just got him on a new project and he like sprained his ankle on the front lawn. There was like a divot. And I was like, dude, you seriously have to be prepared for anything. But like when someone's messing up, ask them what's going on. Don't just be like, you say you'd be done, you know, three weeks ago. What the hell? If you do that, there you always want a, a nice, like good, like you want to be their partner on the project, even if they have no equity, because they're getting paid. You want the relationship to be jovial and friendly, but professional. Like they should, they should be like, hey man, how's it going? Like, you know, this looks great. You know, tell me what's going on here. That relationship should always be professional, but they should want to see you. They shouldn't be worried about getting a phone call from you. You shouldn't talk down to them. Never talk down to anybody. It doesn't matter if they're brand new, because one time I was brand new and I didn't know what that guy was doing. So like I always give, I have, and you have no idea who you're talking to sometimes. Like I met some guy at a meetup in LA who had like 4,000 multifamily units and he like didn't say a word and was just sitting there nicely. But like you never know who's who in this game. You always treat people with the utmost respect, shake their hand, look them in the eye. And when you're negotiating with them, you know, I could talk about estimates and bids and all this stuff for a while, but like, let's just go and do a and a because otherwise I'm just going to keep talking. Um, so Did I you want to plug your shirt too? Yeah, I mean, my buddy Antoine Martel is in LA. He gave me the shirt to wear. I'm not, not really sure. I have like two rental properties, so like, it's not really like on point. Got it's not really on point. But like, cash flows in and flows right back out. When you oh, dude, money. yeah, I just like negative cash flow should be in like this shirt. <laughs> but, um, so, Jared, I got, sure. I got a question yeah, sure, sure, I can sure, kick so. it off. So, a lot of investors or gurus or whatever talk about incentivizing you know, in writing the contract where, okay, if you finish early, you get the, such and such a bonus, tying it to some, you know, metrics with the property, <coughs> property even, or if you finish late, I'm going to duck this much a day. Does that ever work? Because I don't hear real world examples of contracts actually. I've never done it that. Works. I've never done that. Last and week I did something similar to that. We had a drive all our remote and he gave me a three week time day. Was, hey, listen, you finish Sunday, so we can start this Monday, one week before your time table. That's exactly how you do it. You can't do it any other way, though. If, if, because what you said is if, like, hey, I'll give you an extra 5% or, like, part that you involve them in like, equity in the project or profit or whatever, how the hell are they going to so know what your accounting is? How is it? them positively and nothing cash. Finish. An extra 500 or 1,000 bucks at It feels like it was, like, a lot. For he, sure. He was young in the game. He's doing a drywall, and I was like, dude, okay. bucks. If you do a good job, whatever, an extra 500 or 1,000 bucks, like, that works, but... I don't know if it could be done every time. It's just like, you know, so I always, this is just stupid, but I have a master's in education, so I always try to like, when we start talking the contractors, I try to use it like a possible chance. I try to make it this positive spin. Like, I'm not trying to be negative towards them right away. Because we had one guy, like, you're talking about things happen. He had a death, like, a good friend, and he was good. Do you guys know each other, by the way? No. Did you grow up in Akron? Uh, I lived in Fairlawn for like two years, that's where I started. Oh, that's okay. Okay, well, I went to Mayfield, so I'm, orig I'm originally from Cleveland. Went to Mayfield, but anyways. So we had, like you said, injury or stuff happens, you know. And the guy, we were kind of like ready to kick him off the job, and I was like, you know, you just post him out on Facebook, you know, death of the family, cheapest contract we've had. His work's all good. He moves a little bit slower, but we didn't kick him off the job, and he was okay. Yeah. Same thing with the drywaller we got. We had one of our ex employees that we let go, laid off. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna do a lot of editing. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, it, it, it was Jeff Jefferson. <laughs> Anyways, um, interesting to talk about. Oh yeah, so our employee called us and he was like, "Dude, this guy's gonna steal from you. He's gonna rob from you." And you had to get around it. We didn't do any upfront payments for a lot of people who provide materials. Got it. So we put in our Home Depot shopping cart by five o'clock the day before. We'll have it to your job site by eight a.m. So we've cut out a lot of down upfront payments. We say halfway through. Yeah. It's kind of how we try to keep it so we're always on the positive side of sure. life. Yeah, but like holding money at the end of the project, if it's a lot of money, it can get too, like, uh, butting heads. If you're holding, like, let's say you did like a $20,000 yeah, job. We did contract work, that's so why we're stepping away. Or there's holding this, it's been like a month now. Like, like if you're like 20,000, 10 and 10, and they're like literally at the end of the project, like dude, they have had four weeks or like five weeks of paying guys by the hour, and they're so tight at zero because the way you structure your construction contract, 
and ten thousand dollars everything to them. It's paying their mortgage, it's paying their guys, whatever. And if you're holding that whole entire payment, it's way easier to hold a thousand dollars of that and just wait until the end and say, hey, listen, I always hold a thousand dollars until final walkthrough. I'm going to do a final walkthrough. I'm going to ask you, you know, to fix paint touch-ups, doors that aren't hung correctly, basic stuff that would come up on a home inspection or that buyers would catch, because um, you know, flips might be different from you know apartments or whatever. But like the same same deal. Um, so it's, it is important to communicate almost daily, especially if you're managing a project with your, with your contractors, um, offering them incentives and stuff. Like, I mean, if an extra 500 bucks makes them work faster, that's great. We did the math on it. We thought we could finish it before we have our next interest only payment. Yeah. So we're like, our interest only payment is 600 bucks. So yeah. If we get 400, we finish sure. it early, we save 200. Yeah. Just by the timelines we were lined up. Who knows what's going to happen after they finish the paint, but. <laughs> sure. Well, if you guys are doing flips and you have been, like, if you're in a rhythm like me, like I have like three projects I could put guys on tomorrow, they want another project. They could give a, they could give a crap about an extra 500 bucks. They want another $36,000 construction project. They want to keep going. It's about speed and the rhythm and knowing that they have something down the line. The guys who I employ the last two years, they like working with me because they know when a project's finishing up. I can take them to another house, have them bid it out, and by you know they know that they have somewhere to go after that. Most construction guys, especially in the market like Cleveland, most people are mom and pop. They're a small group of guys. They, you know, they're paycheck to paycheck. They have medical bills. They have rent payments due. They have they can make ten grand in a month, but they might not make anything for four weeks. That's a very big reality for these construction guys. And if you respect that and you you know treat them as equals, I would say that that's the best way to get stuff done because then they'll be like, oh, I really liked working for Jared. That you know, guys can text me all the time. Hey man, you got anything going on? And I'm like, oh, I didn't even think of them. They did a job for me two years ago. Because of what you just did. Work this ethic is everything. Unbelievable. Okay. I've yeah. never heard that from anybody. Just you, you can. I mean, I play a lot of poker, so like. I'll give them to you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you can tell if a person, a guy, has a good head on his shoulders just by like how he carries himself, if he looks at you in the eyes, or if he's just shifty. And I mean, apart from that kind of stuff, like there's very little now that we can include in this video because like when I meet a contractor, I'm looking to see if he's on drugs. I met guys my age, early thirties. They have no teeth. You know, they have track marks. They can't complete a sentence they're stuck they're, they're they're on something and it's an automatic no but you don't know that if you're hiring someone over the phone or they go to a job and you don't look someone in the face and kind of can see and touch and feel like what type of person they are so you just as hands-on as possible that's my advice and as far as financial I can give you guys all sorts of advice on protecting your money doing you know estimates and bids the right way so anybody have any questions do you, um, I think I read that you, uh, once you got to like three flips a year, you kind of went out full time. Yeah. Um, did you do any of your own um, construction work or did you go right to contractors first? And come to that? So the first uh, couple flips I did, I did with the contractor I knew for a long time. He ends up screwing me over. So like nobody, like I don't put it past anyone, but I was making like W-2 income, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month, nothing crazy, but like after taxes, it was very comfortable. I was bored. And when I looked at a flip, what I could make in, um, let's just say six months, because it really did take me like three months to do the deal, a month in the beginning to get organized, two months on the retail side to like list it and sell it. Six months was like, a, like I had all my money. But the cool thing is that if you guys have W-2 income, you can call a credit card company and you can call Amex, City, whatever, and tell them, hey, I make $48,000 a year. I'm, I want the, like a the new platinum card, it's like $10,000, you'd be so stated income, they're literally just gonna run your credit. And if you have good credit and you tell them that you make $50,000, that's how credit card companies work. It's not a great business model, a lot of people default, but they also make money that way. So my first like two flips, I got like probably over $30,000 on credit cards and open credit lines. Is zero interest or they? Oh, no. Yeah, they're they're so they're like they're thirteen to twenty percent interest, but you got sixty days to make your first minimum payment. So like even if you're doing a flip, you're gonna get all your money back in four to six months. So like you know if you're a newbie, four to six months, whatever, and you know that that thirty thousand dollars is gonna be coming back, even if you pay six months interest on it, who cares? It's thirty thousand dollars that you get that you don't have to raise from another investor. So you'd be so surprised after doing a couple projects if you ask a contractor like. You've done plenty of work. How many contractors even in Akron accept credit cards? A lot of people like cash and some accept credit cards. Maybe like 50%? Yeah, we got a lot. I'm paying my PayPal. 
pay that little fractional yeah. And, and you just say, here it is, it's PayPal. Well, yeah. I gotta, it costs money, I'll pay that fee. But out of pocket for you guys is zero when you right. use a credit card. So like contractors get paid when, when they invoice you through quick pay, um, not quick pay, uh, <laughs> QuickBooks, <laughs> and they get paid immediately. And you don't have anything out of pocket. So that was the beauty of like me making money as a W2 employee and just calling Amex and being, they, they, will, they raise your credit line even, as long as you're making your payments, they raise your credit line without you even asking. So. At the end of that, I probably had over 60,000 in open credit. I would use that from flip to flip to pay contractors, and I generally only worked with contractors that, I, that would accept credit cards. Um, that was the beginning, and as I built up my capital, um, my first flip I made like maybe 10 grand, eight grand. Um, second one, maybe like 18. But like as I got better, I realized what type of, what type of properties I was focused on getting and that the smaller they are, the more predictable they are. You might make less money, but right now I'm in the mode, especially like with stuff, I'm in such a mode of like, I'd way rather make 18 grand in five weeks, like a quick flip, than have a nightmare like I just had in Shaker and hold it for a year and a half and have the city get involved and have to hire architects and pull permits and be up at night actually thinking about like, are there ever even any buyers in this pool of 350 to 400? That's such a freaking nightmare that you don't want to be in as a new person, but like as far as like leaving your job, I mean, I would say that getting your Rolodex of contractors up is just as important as knowing that you can make money. Like, you can, you can find an investor out in bigger pockets who'd be willing to partner on you on a, with a job if you dig deep and just respond to messages for a couple of weeks. That's not hard. But the hard part is meeting contractors, knowing, like, oh, damn, like this, this driveway has to get done. I got to call a concrete guy. And it's October and it's starting to get cold and most of the concrete guys are busy. Knowing who to call in that situation is just as important as having money aside and knowing that you can make money. So like um, asking other investors to go out, ask them for a referral, say, hey, do you have a good window guy? Do you have a good concrete guy? Do you have a good um, you know, carpenter? <coughs> knowing that kind of stuff and being comfortable that you can make those kind of like relationships and calls when you get a new job and you're like, oh damn, I got this great drywall crew that you know Jeff Jefferson referred me to. Having those relationships is just as important as knowing that you can make money flipping, but also, being comfortable looking at deals, knowing what a good deal looks like, looking at a deal and saying, forget the list price, what would a good price to buy it at would be? Like, forget that it's listed for 47. You know, run your numbers, go to the property, take a contractor or two, have an idea in your mind, like you should know what a square roof costs. You should know how much a square uh, a carpet costs, a square foot. You should know how much it costs to, you know, per square foot to like, buy material and flooring to tile a, a bathroom. Those kind of numbers should be ballpark, you know, 1200 to 1500 bucks. Seeing like a new ceiling that I have to hang. Like if I had to hang this ceiling in here, it'd probably be like, you know, probably over 2000 just because of how big it is. But like a small living room in Warrensville Heights would be 600 bucks. So like I just know after doing this, and I would know who's doing it. So like being able to make those calls on how much stuff costs is, you know, will get you used to building a scope of work and making sure contractors aren't overcharging you for things. Um, so, but the short answer of like leaving your job, I would say like, how, what is the minimum you could live with? Like literally you have an emergency fund, don't touch it. What is the minimum you could live with? And cause that emergency fund carry you for like six months to 12 months. Forget that emergency fund and put it aside. Now, how much money do you want to make a year? You have to make sure, like I don't have kids or anything, but like I have, mortgage, I have food, I have like expenses and stuff like everyone else, but like do people who have kids and families and child support and alimony and car payments and real stuff, it's just like a lender would underwrite you, 40% debt to income ratio. Take that 40%, multiply, you know, yeah. divide it by four and multiply by 10, that number is, you know, generally what you should be looking to make per month and it's hard because you don't know if a flip is gonna go five months or six months. The best thing to do is be our, you know, burr out of a rental property and get a really good deal on one rental property. I forget who said it was in like Brunswick or who's doing. Yeah. Am I right that like inventory in the suburbs is super low? There's good school districts you can charge a premium for rent because I had rentals in Fairlawn charging eighteen hundred a month and I was my mortgage was nine hundred. Those numbers aren't being talked about on bigger pockets because the traditional turnkey investor companies are renovating houses in Maple and Garfield and all these places with traditional $250, $300 returns. That's what, it, that's what people are expecting. But to get a dated grandma's house, 
in Fairlawn or Brunswick or Strongsville and kind of fix it up, but just like rent it out. Here's the thing, appraisers don't give what your scope of your rehab is. They're doing their comps on a good day, they're gonna wake up and you meet the appraiser there and say, hey, you know, we put all this money in the kitchen, we put in new flooring, we upgraded the electrical, we did all this stuff, and guess what? They're taking your like barely flipped Burr dated rental house um, and they're comparing it to actual flips sometimes. So they don't know. Appraisers might have to do eight reports in a day, but if you try to burr out of something that you know can make you 800 or 900 bucks a month, which is a real reality if you're, I mean, I had Airbnbs making me 1500, 1700 a month, but you do have to do more stuff. If you get one, I would way more focus on getting one solid rental property that cash flow is a little bit for you first, and then you get experience doing a little bit of work. If you do something that you know you don't have to do crazy electrical, no wet basement, no like roof tear off, if you don't have those big ticket items like a driveway to redo, then it's a, like I just say dated grandma's house because that's like what a, my first flip was. Cosmetic, do a kitchen, you do a bathroom, um, maybe a little bit of light plumbing electric, but like it's predictable. And if you rent that thing out and you know the numbers are gonna work for you, always stay focused looking at comps because comps control everything, especially if you're gonna burr out of something and especially if you're gonna sell at retail, comps are like know what the comps are gonna be.